I'd like to take a moment to welcome Lindsay Dudfield, who will talk on the McDermott Lithium Deposit at Oregon USA. Uh, Lindsay's been a geologist for around 40 years in multi-commodity exploration, primarily, primarily within Australia. He's held senior positions with the mineral divisions of Amoco and Exxon, and was closely involved in the delineation of the scuttles at Sink Copper Mine at Golden Grove. In 87, he became a founding director of Dalrymple Resources and spent the following eight years helping acquire and, and explore Dalrymple's properties, leading to a number of Greenfields discoveries. In late 94, uh, he joined the board of Horizon Mining, which was Jindalee's predecessor, and has been responsible for managing Jindalee since its inception. Lindsay is a member of the Oz IMM, we'll forgive him for that one, uh, the AIG, the Geological Society of Australia and the Society of Economic Geologists. He's also a non-executive director of Energy Metals Limited and Alchemy Resources Limited. Thank you, Lindsay. Take it away. Yes, thanks very much uh, there, Peter. Thanks for the introduction. I'll just get the screen up with the presentation. Hopefully you can see this. Can you see that all right, Pete? All good, Lindsay. Yeah, all right, excellent. All right, so this presentation is about the discovery of the McDermott Lithium Deposit, uh, located in Oregon and Western USA. Um, and it's sort of the story of how a, a microcap based in West Perth and Western Australia came to sort of find itself the owner of a, what is emerging as one of the largest lithium deposits in, in North America. So the obligatory disclaimer, Okay, so generally as a project generator, we um, uh, we were, this is this is the advertorial if you like, so we'll get it over and done with quickly guys. Uh, we listed in 2002 after raising uh, two and a half million dollars. Um, so we've been listed for, what's that, 19 years or coming up to. Uh, we've been largely self-funded through joint ventures and asset sales and um, uh, our first capital raising was completed in 2019, and that was to fund uh, the drilling at the McDermott uh, project, which we'll be talking about. Uh, and, you know, there's been three spin outs have come out of Jindalee, including Energy Metals, which was a uranium uh, spin out that was very successful. Uh, we paid a 55 cent fully frank dividend in 2010. Uh, and as you can see from our portfolio of projects in Western Australia and, and the US, and the fact that we've made money for our shareholders out of uranium, we're commodity agnostic. So we'll go to where we think we can make uh, uh, money, the best money for our shareholders, best return for our shareholders. Uh, so in Western Australia, for example, we've got a very strong uh, uh, position in the Widgee Multha uh, area, just south of Kalgoorlie, which is uh, primarily prospective for nickel and for gold. Uh, but uh, tonight, or this afternoon, I'll be talking about the McDermott uh, uh, project which is located in the United States. Okay. So lithium, it's a lithium deposit, McDermott. So why is it important? Uh, you know, m m lithium is is the metal for the 21st century. Much as the steam engine uh, and coal uh, dominated the 1800s, and the internal combustion engine dominated the 1900s. Uh, with the Model T Ford commencing production in 1908. Uh, so electric uh, engines uh, powered by lithium ion batteries will dominate this century and also um, energy storage using lithium ion batteries as well. Uh, everyone's familiar with, you know, obviously lithium ion batteries, and mobile phones and, and, and you know, other battery uh, devices. Uh, this is the, um, the Tesla Model 3 played. It is the fastest production car ever made. Does the standing quarter mile in around nine seconds. Uh, and uh, by comparison, the Bugatti uh, Veyron does it 9.7. Um, and uh, not to 100 kilometers an hour in two seconds. Uh, top speed of 322 kilometers an hour. So these are, these are pretty impressive uh, performance figures. Um, Petrol heads would be kind of absolutely spinning when they see Harley Davidson have put out a um, an electric uh, Harley. Uh, you can uh, get it in Australia, fifty thousand dollars right away. Uh, and the latest one uh, was the Hummer, uh, General Motors uh, Hummer. Uh, electric Hummer was uh, advertised in October 
last year sold out for, for, for delivery in 12 months, so October 2021, sold out in 10 minutes. So look, it's the way it's going. Um, uh, you know, uh, lithium uh, iron batteries, and obviously lithium is the principal um, uh, metal, uh, you know, is, is the way of the future. And um, it's, it's uh, there's, a, there's a, a tidal wave of demand, which is just, it's coming. Uh, a little bit of background on, on, on lithium and its properties, which make it a fantastic metal for, for, uh, for batteries. Uh, probably uh, one that older people would uh, take note of. The uh, typical lithium ion rechargeable battery can hold four times as much energy as that in a, in a standard lead ion, uh, lead acid battery in, in, your, uh, in, in, your, uh, in your standard car. Uh, interestingly, that uh, Sony first commercialised lithium ion batteries in, in the early 1990s. Uh, by 2015, uh, roughly a third, just over, of lithium was was used in batteries, and within four years, this had risen to 65%. Uh, roughly two thirds of uh, consumption of lithium went into into uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, mainly for use, as it says there, in electric vehicles or EVs and energy storage. And the demand for EVs and energy storage is expected to um, uh, drive increased demand for lithium going forward. It's also got other properties, but you know the, the primary uh, demand for lithium is for use in batteries. Okay, so this slide just shows that uh, EVs are the key uh, driver for lithium demand going forward. Uh, and that um, uh, the market is expected to, uh, it's currently in surplus, but the lithium price is starting to come up. Uh, it's come up, I think, almost 70% since uh, uh, the 1st of January uh, and uh, expected to go into um, deficit around 2025, um, driven, as I said, by demand for EVs. So um, we're in the US, so obviously politics are particularly important and uh, Biden's election has been very positive for lithium there. Uh, you know, he has pledged to spend $2 trillion on EV infrastructure and other carbon reduction projects. Uh, importantly, it is a move towards zero emissions by 2050. And importantly, there is bipartisan support for the development of critical mineral projects in the US, including uh, lithium projects. And uh, this is a, uh, this, this uh, lady here, Jennifer Granholm, she is now the head of the Department of Energy, very powerful US government agency, uh, and um, very pro, uh, very pragmatic uh, in her approach. And she's basically quoted as saying, look, we can buy electric car batteries from Asia, or we can make them in America. And clearly that's where they're heading. Uh, in fact, um, uh, there are already battery factories uh, producing lithium ion batteries and, and, and et cetera. Uh, for example, everyone's heard of the Gigafactory in Nevada owned by uh, Tesla. Tesla are currently building the Terra factory uh, in, in just outside of Austin, Texas. And there are plenty of other battery factories either um, uh, operating under construction or planned. Um, just showing here the, the two lithium projects that Jindalee owns in the US, the McDermott project, which is the, the, the main, um, what I'll mainly be talking about. Uh, we also have a, a smaller project called Clayton North, which sits in Nevada, uh, just immediately north of Albemarle's uh, Silver Peak, uh, brine, lithium brine operation, which is the only operating lithium mine in the United States. Um, so it's all very well uh, wanting uh, to have lithium ion batteries made in America from US lithium and then feeding into a, 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 a rising EV production uh, assembly lines. Just one catch. Currently, the US produces only 1.2% of 
the world's lithium. So it is heavily reliant on imported lithium. Um, and 80%, up to 80% of the precursor minerals for lithium ion batteries are actually produced in China from both Australian and South American sourced lithium. And so the US, if it wants to make this transition from internal combustion engines to, to uh, EVs and energy storage, uh, basically the electrification of the United States, and it wants to do it without being vulnerable, then it needs to source lithium from, you know, from the US. And, and so there needs to be, uh, it needs to be a hell of a lot uh, more lithium produced out, out of the United States. Um, uh, so there's no disruption to their electrification plans. So a little bit the, about the, the occurrence of lithium. Currently there are, lithium is, is produced from two main sources, the brine deposits in, in uh, South America, so dominated by Chile and Argentina, which produce approximately 50% of the, the world's uh, lithium, and from pegmatites, which are mainly in Australia, which produce pretty well the other 50%, so predominantly Western Australia and dominated by green bushes being the largest uh, uh, pegmatite uh, deposit in the world, um, certainly operating deposit. There's one other source of, well, there's three other, so immediately come to mind, uh, unconventional sources of lithium. Um, there's there's um, uh, geothermal, uh, as a source of lithium. So there's two main uh, uh, deposits there. There's one in Germany, which is held by a, um, uh, an ASX listed company called Vulcan Energy. Uh, and there's um, uh, in the Western uh, the US and California, there's, uh, there's also a very large uh, lithium, uh, uh, geothermal lithium project, which currently isn't producing, but which is, you know, which is being investigated. Uh, there's also unconventional source of lithium from, say, lipidolites, you know, micas. Uh, but as far as the US is concerned, by far the, the, uh, the greatest chance of being uh, able to produce their own lithium and, and be self-sufficient uh, lies with these sediment-hosted, or some people call them clay-hosted, uh, deposits. Uh, they are a major potential source of lithium for the United States, though not yet in commercial production. So we were attracted to uh, sediment hosted lithium deposits. Uh, so what, if you like, piqued our interest? Um, well, there's the three most advanced uh, deposits in this class are uh, the Thacker Pass deposit, which sits in northern Nevada uh, and owned by a company called Lithium Americas, listed on TSX. Uh, the um, Rhyolite Ridge uh, deposit, which is actually owned by an Australian uh, co listed company, ASX listed company called Iron Ear. Um, and that is actually a, a lithium boron uh, uh, project. And the third one is in Mexico. Uh, it's the Sonora project, and that is owned by an AIM listed company called Bacanora Lithium. All three of these companies have put out um, uh, financial studies uh, ranging from PFS through to DFS level, and, and all of them have in indicated that uh, they should be able to produce lithium uh, carbonate, which is the kind of precursor uh, for production of, of lithium ion batteries at uh, $4,000 US a ton or below if you include uh, byproduct credits. Uh, and so this, this got us interested. We, we felt that uh, even though there were none of these deposits were in production, we felt that this was an emerging class of, of uh, or source of lithium that had the potential to uh, produce lithium over a long, uh, long mine life at, at low cost. So obviously uh, attractive. Um, and, you know, basically the, the key to it of these deposits is uh, really at the front end, as you can see from this, and it's highly simplified and I'm not a metallurgist, so I, I can't go into great 
deal of difficult uh, of uh, detail, but uh, lithium is 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 contained in brine, say in South America. They're pumped to the surface uh, uh, into um, bigger uh, evaporation ponds. They sit there for two years or so, uh, and with solar evaporation, you you accumulate the the lithium and the other anions in the brine. Uh, it is purified, uh, then you wind up with a, a, a lithium sulfate solution, which again is purified and then, you know, depending on which way you go, you either produce lithium carbonate or more, more recently lithium hydroxide uh, for sale to your customers, uh, mostly in China currently, uh, where they then produce it into, uh, turn it into um, uh, battery chemicals. Uh, in the case of peg pegmatites, obviously, you know, you're talking open pit mines, uh, you crush the, the ore, it is concentrated. Uh, so it starts off with a, a grade of around about one and a half percent or so uh, Li2O. Uh, and, and you can get that up to say around 5% uh, through simple mechanical concentration techniques, uh, gravity um, sort of uh, concentration, et cetera. And, and then that is at this point, time that concentrate is currently shipped to China and all of the value add takes place from here on takes place in China. So it's calcined and leached with sulfuric acid which produces a lithium sulfate and then basically you drop out all of the uh, uh, you know the anions that you don't want, uh, the iron etc and then uh, basically you're left with a, a lithium carbonate or if you heat that up and drive the uh, uh, drive the CO2 off, you, you wind up with um, lithium hydroxide. Uh, in the case of the sediment hosted lithium deposits, and I, and I caution that none of these are in production currently. So this is based on pilot, pilot plant work done on mainly the, the, the three that I mentioned previously. Um, and, and particularly we've modeled our, our you know, sort of simplified flow sheet on, on the Thacker Pass deposit, which is the one that's closest to us and the, and the, the most similar to, to our McDermott deposit. Uh, you mine uh, and uh, it, it sticks out of the ground. So your mining costs and it's soft, the sediment. So uh, the mining costs are low, crushing is low. We found that we can upgrade our ore, which uh, is, is a big positive, not only increases the head grade, lithium head grade, but also removes some of the uh, acid consuming minerals. Uh, we've spent a lot of time and we're continuing to spend a lot of time at this part here where we, we uh, I'll go back. The major cost, operating cost of this style of deposit is acid um, to leach the lithium out of the ore. And so if you can reduce your acid costs, obviously that, that you know, significantly improves the economics of your project. So you know, we're currently proposing to leach using sulfuric acid, but you'll see later on we can we get you know, excellent recovery using uh, hydrochloric acid as well. Uh, but sulfuric acid is very cheap in the United States. That produces a lithium sulfate solution similar to the brines and the pigmentites, and then the process is pretty similar to, say, a brine from there on. So why did we decide to go for lithium hosted, uh, sediment hosted lithium in, in the United States? So we started looking at, seriously, at um, uh, lithium in the US around the middle of 2017. And we were encouraged by the, the um, public announcements by Lithium Americas on their Thacker Pass deposit and by Iron Air, which was then called Global Geoscience, uh, on their Rhyolite Ridge deposit. Uh, and we could see this as an emerging class of deposit that was going to be a serious contender. Uh, obviously, the backdrop for lithium was, was positive. You know, it was, the demand was expected to increase um, significantly. And also, as I mentioned previously, uh, the US was uh, importing all of its, pretty well all of its lithium for lithium ion batteries. Uh, and so it was very vulnerable and, and remains very vulnerable to supply chain disruption. So there was a, an opportunity we felt there. Um, and, and I felt there, was, there were really strong uh, uh, parallels with the rise of unconventional hydrocarbons in the United States. 
Uh, and for those of you that aren't familiar with this, a really interesting story. Um, through the mid 90s into the mid 2000s, the US was importing a huge amount of uh, hydrocarbons. You know, for example, it says there, you know, natural gas rose 41%, you know, through that decade or so. And they were building liquefied natural gas terminals on the coast to import uh, natural gas. And yet by 2009, the US has surpassed Russia as the largest, world's largest producer of gas. And the gas price was obviously as a result was falling. And that then meant, you know, electricity generators replaced coal with natural gas and drove down the cost of electricity, which is really important for, for intensive industries, you know, to have low cost electricity. As we know in Australia, um, you know, to be competitive, you need uh, low energy costs. And in fact, by 2013, as it says there, these LNG terminals that have been built to import natural gas were turning around and exporting uh, gas. They had a surplus. Uh, and uh, as I said, you know, coal-fired power stations were switching to gas and, and, um, uh, and you know, it was uh, amazing. Um, and in fact, uh, the US uh, became the world's largest oil producer in 2017 and is expected to be a net oil exporter in a couple of years' time, which is an amazing turnaround. And obviously, this, as I said, apart from making US industry more competitive, it also means you're not paying to have a, a fleet sitting in the Middle East protecting your, your you know, your oil uh, pipelines, etc. So, so um, you know, it was a, it's made a huge difference to the economics uh, in the US. And so, what were the drivers for this incredible turnaround? Um, well, obviously, you need endowment, and they had huge amount of uh, gas, in particular locked up in, in shales, uh, so, you know, tight gas. Uh, they, there were technological advances that, uh, that made it possible to liberate this, this gas from, from the tight, tight rocks, from the shales, uh, particularly horizontal drilling, where they could, you know, obviously drill a vertical hole and then whiz, whiz along one of these tight gas stratas uh, and, and, uh, and then uh, basically fracking, where they could open up the strata and, and, and allow the, the, the gas to be uh, extracted. Uh, the price, obviously, you know, uh, technology, et cetera, um, you know, new technology and, and, and unconventional technology costs money. Uh, but if you've got a, an oil price that was, was high, uh, then that made it attractive to, to pursue this. And, and clearly government support. The, the US government could see that, you know, this was... was if they could pull this off, this was going to be a fantastic thing for the economy. And so there was strong government support in, in the form of, you know, tax concessions, etc. So if you like, those four elements all uh, combined to for the success story. And you can see it here, you know, you can see that, you know, the export, uh, sorry, the importing of, of hydrocarbons. So this is both oil and gas um, uh, increasing up till about 2009, where it started falling and by you know, just before 2020, say 2019, certainly, uh, the US became a, a net exporter of energy. Uh, so a fantastic story. And we could see very strong analogies with what could happen with lithium in the United States. Um, and clearly, as it says down here, you know, uh, lithium deposits like Thacker Pass at that stage, which was, uh, you know, this is prior to the discovery of McDermott. Uh, you know, had, had the potential to make the US self-sufficient in lithium. Uh, so on the back of that, we visited in March 2018, at the very end of their winter, we visited several localities in the, in the Western US, uh, which, you know, we'd identified as having the potential for these sediment-hosted lithium deposits. So um, as a result of that, we wound up uh, pegging two areas, the McDermott, project which sits on the Oregon Nevada border and the Clayton North uh, project which sits as I said just north of Albemarle's uh, Silver Peak operation. So I, I won't talk about uh, 
Clayton North because that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, still early stage. We haven't drilled it yet, um, uh, but we've sampled it. Uh, and um, uh, it uh, most of the work has been done on McDermott. So I, I should say that we, when we went across in March 2018, uh, we'd identified 10 or 12 areas from Arizona right through to uh, Oregon up here, basically, this is the northernmost area we visited, which we felt were uh, had potential to host large sediment hosted lithium deposits. Um, and we sampled many of those areas. Um, we sent the samples to ALS in Reno, ALS being uh, obviously a sponsor of, of, uh, of uh, this, uh, this uh, AIG in, in Queensland. Uh, and we got the results back uh, in April. Uh, we sent a pegging crew out to peg these two areas. The, the rest of the areas we, we decided not to peg. Uh, and uh, we announced uh, that the BLM had granted us, granted the claims uh, at McDermott and Clayton North that was announced in June 2018. Okay, so a little bit about the formation of sedimentary lithium deposits. So it's important to understand how they form. Um, in the case of McDermott and Thacker Pass, as you'll see in the next slide, uh, they've formed within lake sediments in, inside the McDermott caldera. Uh, and uh, the McDermott caldera contains rhyolites that are anomalous, highly anomalous in lithium. So very high lithium background in this particular um, uh, caldera and uh, Thacker Pass had already been uh, identified as the largest lithium deposit in the United States. Um, so formation of, of, the, um, uh, of the deposits, well, you know, there are two schools of thought as to how these deposits form and probably it's a mixture of both. Uh, one school of thought uh, has it that the, 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 the tufts, uh, uh, the lavas, et cetera, that, as I said, are very, very high in lithium, very high lithium background. Uh, as they weather, uh, meteoric waters dissolve the lithium and, and basically transport it into the, into the, uh, the sediments uh, in the um, Caldera Lake where they are absorbed onto um, clays within the, the sediments in the, in the lake. And the second source potentially is hydrothermal fluids that are either coming up uh, ring, ring fractures, et cetera, around the edge of the caldera and bringing up with them uh, lithium rich fluids or the heat from uh, circulating magmatic fluids, basically dissolving, causing lithium in the, in the, in the um, underlying volcanics to be uh, dissolved and then, and then uh, basically precipitated in the lake sediments. And it's, as I said, it's probably a, a um, mixture of both of these processes. Uh, the the, the um, mineral, which has been identified as being the, the, the mineral that's hosting the lithium is a hectorite, uh, which is a lithium rich um, a smectite uh, clay. Um, and, and um, we're actually sponsoring a, a, a master's student at the University of uh, Reno, Nevada. Uh, and there's also other, some of the other explorers in the area are also uh, sponsoring research uh, into this dollar deposit. Because as I said, they're, they're, they're very relatively new. They're not well understood. And I, I suspect there's gonna be more of them, probably not in the Western US, uh, but there could well be more of the solar deposit, say in South America, for example. I um, should also point out that the, around the rim of the caldera, uh, there are, uh, so the lithium occurs in the sediments in the center of the uh, uh, caldera and around the rim of the caldera. So, you know, for example, in these sorts of positions along these uh, ring fractures, there's mercury uh, mines. In fact, there's the largest uh, uh, mercury mine in North America, uh, what was. Um, uh, there's uranium deposits around the rim of the caldera, and there's uh, some uh, some silver uh, and gold uh, deposits as well, though very small. 
So this is a, a Google Earth image of the uh, McDermott Caldera around here. This is the Thacker Pass deposit, uh, which, as I said, currently is the largest lithium deposit in the United States. Um, and uh, our ground sitting up here in the northern part of the caldera, just over the Oregon-Nevada um, state boundary, uh, and west of the uh, township of McDermott. These patches here, I don't know if you can see those, but they're actually, they're the old um, McDermott mercury mine, which as I said, was the largest uh, mercury mine in the United States. Um, so the history of formation of the caldera, uh, it, it's located at the point of origin of what's known as the yellow stone hot spot. Uh, and it was this, this uh, area here, if you go back 25 odd million years ago, was about on the margin of the Western margin of the North American craton. And it is, uh, assumed that you had a, a, a slab that was being subducted under the craton, it kind of jammed, and then you had a, a, um, a mantle plume or a hot spot basically dissolved some of that slab. It also then continued and, and thinned the crust. Um, you wound up with an outpouring of basalts, particularly north of the caldera. You can just kind of see through here. These these are all basalt flows. They're very extensive through uh, through into Oregon, uh, and um, and then you had uh, uh, explosion about sixteen point four million years ago. So we're talking Miocene. They're relatively young. Uh, you had a, an explosive eruption of um, rhyolites. And, and then the whole system collapsed. And that was your basically your caldera, uh, formed your caldera. And, and so it's about 40 Ks from north to south and about 25 Ks east west. So it's, you know, so it's a large caldera. Um, and, uh, and then this caldera filled with, with, uh, with clays and, and sandstones and, and a lot of tophaceous sediments, which, you know, as I said earlier, were are interpreted to be the, uh, at least uh, in part, source of the, the lithium in this, in this area. And, um, and that took over about 300,000 years for the, uh, for the um, uh, sediments to, to fill the caldera. And then um, there was hydrothermal activity about just 15 million years or so ago. Uh, which may, as I said, may have also introduced lithium into the system. And I mentioned the mercury mines here. There's also a mercury mine that sits outside of our claim bounds here called the opalite mine. Uh, and there's a, a large uh, uranium uh, deposit that sits in the basement uh, andesites that's up in here called, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it. And there's also some uh, small uranium occurrences down the western margin of the, of the caldera as well. Uh, so as I said, Thacker Pass is the largest uh, lithium deposit in the United States. There's about uh, uh, 8.3 million tonnes of lithium carbonate equivalent. Uh, it was found in the 1980s and it was found actually by Chevron. They were drilling down through the sediments to hit the, the andesitic basalts that sit below that, uh, which had, um, uh, you know, that identified uh, uranium mineralization. So they were chasing uranium mineralization and, and in the, uh, analyzed the overlying lake sediments and bingo, they were anomalous, highly anomalous in, in lithium. Um, so as I said, we've discovered uh, pegged McDermott in, in 2018 and um, in, uh, in 2019, November 2019, announced an initial resource of uh, seven and a half million tons of lithium carbonate equivalent at a thousand ppm cutoff. Uh, and there's uh, currently we're we're just waiting on the last uh, assay results from our 2020 drilling program, which was completed mid 2000 uh, mid December 2020. And you know you'll see these are you know will lead to a significant increase we believe in in the size of the resource. Uh, so basically, this photograph was taken when we first went into the area in, in, uh, in March 2018. Um, 
this, this mesa, if you like, that's about 40 to 50 meters high. Uh, it is the, the ore. It is basically, we channel sampled it from the surface to the valley floor, um, you know, in, in, in quite a few locations. And it was on the basis of the assay results from that channel sampling that uh, uh, we decided to go ahead and peg it. Um, and the mineralization is on average around 100, and, or sorry, the mineralized sedimentary package is on average around 150 meters thick. And we're currently looking, as I said, about the top 40 to 50 meters through here. Um, this is a photograph we uh, taken when we, we initially sampled it in 2018 prior to pegging it. Um, and you can see there, it's, you know, you've got laminated uh, fine grain sediments, some sandy bands, etc. cetera. Um, uh, this is drilling the first hole at McDermott. Uh, this was uh, a proof. We drilled four proof of concept holes in September, 2018. And um, fortunately, you know, they, they did prove the concept, uh, even though they were abandoned, had to be abandoned at an average of 90 meters each because that, you know, we had all sorts of, uh, drilling issues, you know, inexperienced drillers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we still managed to demonstrate that there were significant thicknesses of mineralized sediments here. And um, uh, just a photograph of the core, uh, you know, just typical cores that had come out of the, uh, out of the, um, uh, out of the, out of the rig, off the rig. It was, uh, we drilled uh, HQ triple tube. Uh, the samples were, were logged, uh, marked up in the field and then shipped to ALS in Reno where uh, the, uh, the, the samples were, uh, the core was cut in two meter intervals and, and assayed for uh, lithium and about, I think 47 other elements. And um, so by the end of 2019, we drilled 13 core holes. So four in 2018, none of which got through the entire sedimentary package and into the basement. And then another nine holes were drilled in 2019. Uh, and, you know, so basically very simplified schematic here, you know, you're sitting on a volcanic basement, there's andesite, uh, andesitic in composition, and you've got uh, these laminated flat lying sediments um, up to 186 metres we've drilled of, of a sedimentary package. Okay. Uh, now I mentioned that we're, um, we're sponsoring a master's sorry, an honours student at uh, University of Reno, so um, Nevada, so uh, Sarah Holden, uh, and this is just a, a, present, uh, a slide from a presentation she gave at the end of 2020, uh, just sort of highlighting some of the features she had identified in the, in, in the core. Um, so you've got, you know, as it says, their secondary uh, cross-cutting calcite veins and, and uh, uh, this is a lithium rich material, very fine grain laminated, you know, um, clay rich sediments. Um, she's got here, uh, obviously silica and clay alternating. This is a sandy band, uh, which is, is, is poor, uh, almost barren uh, in, uh, in lithium. Um, so you can see it's sort of like a low energy quiescent sort of environment, which is you know what you'd expect if the if uh, you know the volcanic activity had subsided and you just had you know um, uh, the sediments the the the, the tuffs, if you like around the outside of the caldera being slowly um, weathered and, and washing into the washing into the uh, into the lake um, so you know laminations rhythmic banding uh, she also identified can't see any in here but she identified desecration uh, desiccation uh, features, cracks, etc. And there's also some zeolites that have been identified. So, you know, it's obviously was emergent at, at times. Uh, so in November 2019, we, uh, we published or announced the a maiden resource for McDermott. Uh, so using a uh, 1750 ppm cutoff and um, it, uh, only taking mineralization in the top 100 meters. Uh, uh, that, that basically gave us a resource of 155 million tons at 2000 ppm. 
Uh, so that's about 1.7 million tonnes of contained um, uh, lithium carbonate equivalent. But we could see very importantly, there was a, a, a very large, this, this uh, prospective uh, sediment package, as you would expect, is, is, is laterally very continuous. It goes for kilometres. And, um, and we could see it outcropping sort of, you know, in areas well away from where we drilled. And so the, the consultant who put together the exploration target was very confident uh, that, um, uh, sorry, the resource, that the, he could also uh, uh, estimate an exploration target range uh, from, you know, anywhere between, you know, 180 million tonnes and 330 million tonnes at that cutoff grade. And interestingly, this, uh, resource was estimated uh, prior to us doing any, uh, you know, confirming that we could beneficiate the ore. Um, and uh, we've since been, you know, demonstrated we can, and we can, you know, get substantial uplift in, in, in grade, head grade. Uh, and if we're able to drop the cutoff grade to 1000 PPM, uh, which is the cutoff grade that most of our peers have been using, um, 900 to 1000 ppm seems to be pretty common uh, they're used by uh, north american juniors for this style of deposit um you know we wind up with almost a billion tons at 14 odd hundred ppm uh, and a substantial exploration target range surrounding that resource um, so if we, if we're able to convert uh, some of that exploration target range and use a lower cutoff grade than the 1750 uh, McDermott uh, is on track to be the largest lithium deposit in the in the US. So these are like the porphyry coppers of the lithium space. They're very big, they're low grade, uh, they've got some uh, you know some technical challenges if you if you like, primarily in the in the extraction. Uh, the metallurgy is the key to them. Uh, but if you can crack that, then you're looking at very long life deposits. Stacker Pass, for example, their PFS proposes a 46 year mine life. Uh, and, um, you know, I think McDermott, all going well, will, will also turn out to be something similar. So this shows the uh, plan view, if you like, showing the inferred resource that was announced in November 2019, uh, shown here in red surrounded by the exploration uh, target ranges at the lower limit and the upper limit. Um, and, um, and as you can see, well, this was our former claim boundary at the end of 2019. So in 2020, we went and pegged additional claims out to the west here, because uh, we could see uh, in outcrop the sediments you know continued well out to the west and and so we basically wanted to make sure we secured them um in uh in uh, at the start of this uh, sorry last year 2020 uh clearly uh you know the financial markets were in turmoil we had covid starting we didn't think we'd be able to drill uh through 2020 uh but we were able to go back to our shareholders in i think it was september raise a bit of money, uh, primarily to, to fund drilling here. Uh, and so uh, we proposed 21 holes. These are the yellow dots uh, shown here. Uh, and uh, we were able to drill, commence drilling in mid-November. Uh, and we drilled 15 holes before the drillers came back from Thanksgiving with COVID. And we had to shut suspend the program uh, and uh, basically our guys because we had a couple of geologists and a fieldy on site managing the program for us uh, get get them tested and then they had to quarantine for two weeks and and you know by it was just about Christmas by then and winter had arrived so that was the end of the program um, but they these holes the holes that we did drill were we tried uh, wet RC drilling uh, for a change we'd actually twin this whole M, uh, MDD, so that's one of the dot core holes. We twinned that with a, uh, uh, with a, with a, a wet RC hole at the very end of 2019, and it actually came back with sort of similar results to the core results. So we were pretty confident that we could use wet RC and, and uh, it, would, it should give us results that we could, uh, we could use in a, in a resource update. Um, so this was as the program was proposed before we commenced drilling. 
So this is uh, just some happy snaps of the drilling program through uh, late last year. Uh, you can see the rig down here on the flats. Um, basically, uh, you can see the lithium rich sediments, the top of them outcropping through here. Um, again, here's the rig sitting on top of lithium rich sediments here and all you can see through pretty well in the, in the foreground and middle distance is, uh, uh, is potential uh, mineralization, mineralized sediments. So as a result, um, uh, we, as I said, we, we had to cut the program short with 15 RC holes. Uh, and we have published the results from uh, 11 of those holes with the last four holes uh, results being imminent. Um, and we, we intersected uh, broad lithium uh, grade, you know, intercepts in, in every hole that we drilled. Um, and, and quite a few of the holes were mineralized over the entire sedimentary package that was inter intersected. So for example, um, hole six, which is on this section here, sorry, here, uh, the, the intercept shown here on the section, which was published, uh, you know, an, uh, announced on ASX, is, is at the 1000 ppm uh, cutoff. So anything over 1000 ppm. But um, if you take the entire section from, from surface to basically the, uh, the, the bottom of the sedimentary package, that goes about 126 meters of 1400 ppm. Um, uh, similarly, hole 10, uh, which sits here, uh, if you take the entire section from surface to the andesite uh, basement, the sediments resting on, there's about 120 metres of, again, 1400 ppm or so. So big widths of, of mineralised material. Um, also point out that uh, these holes, so on this section, say 9, 10, 11, 12, Nine is within the inferred resource, 10, 11, and 12 are sitting outside the resource. So, and you can see they're all mineralized. So, you know, uh, in fact, by scale, um, hole 12 is 500 meters or 480 meters from hole 11. So, you know, you're talking a significant potential addition of tons here at, uh, in the southeast corner of the deposit. So this area here. Uh, also, hole four up to the north, we stepped out. That was also mineralized. So the mineralization was the better grade was at depth, but, but we should extend the the, the uh, resource at least uh, some distance out here. And uh, we're waiting on the results for for holes like hole 15 outside the resource, 16 outside the resource, etc. Uh, and you know, 15 in particular, if that comes in, then we should see an increase in the resource. So what what we were trying to do was to uh, not only infill the existing inferred resource, so we can hopefully lift its status up into, uh, into the uh, uh, indicated category, but also expand that uh, inferred resource out, you know, sort of to package it up. And then, and then once we've got a mixture of uh, indicated and inferred, we can then uh, uh, hopefully announce a scoping study, uh, a complete scoping study and announce that to the market. So, um, so pretty encouraging results to date so far. Um, just touching on metallurgy very quickly, but as I said, this is probably the key to the to um, these deposits. Um, the we've shown that uh, screening, as I said, and, and uh, attrition scrubbing uh, it confirmed that about seventy five percent of the lithium is contained in the very fine clay fraction, uh, minus ten micron, um, uh, and uh, by rejecting the coarser fraction, you also reject 50% um, uh, or so of the carbonate, which is obviously an acid consuming mineral, and also um, a zeolite called anelcine, which is also a, a, an acid consumer. Uh, so this is, you know, we think will have very positive implications for um, the economics of the project. Um, we've demonstrated obviously that we can get very high recoveries um, 97% uh, with sulfuric acid within two hours and I think 99% with hydrochloric within 30 minutes. Um, as it mentioned, uh, beneficiation using attrition scrubbing, this was um, 
as announced uh, at the end of last year, uh, we put out an announcement last month, uh, an update where we, um, uh, using 30% solids, we were able, we're, we've been able to get a 60.9, so let's say 61% uplift in, in the head grain, um, and also uh, reduce acid consumption on the beneficiated sample by 26%. So um, per lithium unit. So you know these are these are positive uh, po positive developments. Um, conventional wisdom was that. Uh, it was very hard to extract the lithium from hectarites, or particularly you know, in, in this area. But I think we've shown, and also Lithium Americas at the Thacker Pass deposit have shown that um, actually the, the lithium ions are, are probably very uh, loosely bound, absorbed onto the clays, and you're able to strip them off really quickly. I think the... the um, assumption was that they were bound very tightly within the matrix of the clays, uh, but clearly our metallurgical results um, demonstrate that's not the case at all. You know, it's actually, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not the equivalent to refractory, if you like. Um, and so there's further test work ongoing, you know, and we'll probably, the next step will be on the purification uh, uh, stage, we will probably produce uh, lithium carbonate, demonstrate you can produce, hopefully, battery grade uh, lithium carbonate from the pregnant liquor solution that we, we generate from leaching the ore with sulfuric acid. Uh, so what is there to look forward to? So I said, you know, we, we're continuing with uh, metallurgical test work to continue to drive uh, uh, operating costs hopefully down. Um, there'll be, as soon as we've got the, uh, the last lot of assay results from the last four holes, uh, they'll be uh, plugged into the database and uh, we expect to be able to announce an updated uh, resource estimate and also uh, exploration target range uh, by the end of this month, all going well. Uh, and then we'll, uh, that'll morph into a, uh, it will be used for a, a a scoping study. I've said there March, April, this was, you know, prior to the delay in getting the SA results back. So certainly, you know, there'll be a scoping study out in the June quarter and and um, it could be early, early-ish in the June quarter if, if we do it to ASX standards or if we do it to a North American uh, 43101 standards, which they call a preliminary economic assessment or a PEA, uh, it'll probably be towards the end of the quarter. Um, we will be submitting the drilling program uh, for 2021 very soon in the next few weeks uh, and uh, expect to be drilling all going well, um, probably July, August uh, this year. Uh, so we tend to drill in the summer uh, once the ranchers have taken their, their cattle off the sagebush. And clearly um, it's a US project. Uh, you know, um, the, probably the, the rightful owner of this project will be a large US corporation. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to continue to de-risk the project and, and, uh, and add value to it. So in summary, um, global warming obviously uh, has focused attention on, on lithium. Uh, for lithium ion batteries as a way of um, of not only reducing carbon emissions, uh, but also st storing energy from renewable energy sources. And as a result, lithium demand is expected to increase significantly. And as we saw from that graph earlier, it's driven mainly uh, by EVs and energy storage. Uh, we're looking at uh, a, a target of zero emissions in the US by 2050, and, and uh, Biden is backing up the pledge with, with big dollars. Um, and battery factories are already uh, un, uh, operating and, and under construction to, to fulfill this pledge. However, uh, the US is very vulnerable uh, to supply chain disruption, not only for lithium, but also rare earths, et cetera, which have been quite prominent. Um, and there is, fortunately, there is bipartisan support for the development of US critical mineral projects. Um, 
at their battery day um, uh, in September last year, uh, Tesla announced it was uh, it had acquired the rights to a sediment hosted lithium deposit in, in Nevada. It's looking to so source its lithium from wherever possible from US deposits. And we expect the other US auto makers will follow. Uh, and sediment hosted deposits, because of their scale, they have the potential to make the US self-sufficient in lithium. And just a final slide here. Uh, this is Pip Darvel, who was our former CEO and, and managing director on site at McDermott in March 2018, when we first went over there and, and, uh, and sampled this and other localities in the Western US. Um, and I acknowledge uh, Pip's uh, role in, in generating the targets that we went and sampled uh, in, in that field trip, and, and also for managing the uh, subsequent drilling programs, uh, you know, in an area where we never operated before, very difficult to know, you know, who, who to use and how to go about doing things. And he, he did a great job in, in you know, in, in driving the project forward. So, you know, all kudos to, to Pip for his, uh, for his effort there. So um, thanks very much, Pip. Thanks, Lindsay, for an excellent talk. Um, I know you've got a board meeting, but we've got a couple of questions, if you don't mind uh, spending another few minutes with us. Yeah, well, sure. No, no, I think we've got probably 25 minutes will be good, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> save you the chairman's special question. <laughs> um, question from Kim Frankham. Uh, as the outcrops fall close to it, do you see it in multi-spectral data? In other words, uh, let's say, for instance, ASTA, um, and do you, know or expect that it has an EM response? You know, is there a quicker way uh, to find these in the field other than sampling? Well, in this particular case, you could see it in Google Earth. Um, you know, if you go back and have a look at the, the images, uh, you won't see Thacker Pass on Google Earth because it's covered with about 10 metres or so of colluvium. Uh, but because, you know, uh, these things sticking out of the ground, they were pretty obvious. Uh, if, and, and what we did basically is we combined, all, it was all public domain information, USGS uh, uh, mapping, um, uh, some theses that have been done, some research work that have been done by various uh, US um, uh, agencies and, and, um, uh, and also universities. And we sort of combined all that. And it, this was our number one target uh, because it had, Already, the Caldera already hosted the, the largest uh, deposit, uh, lithium deposit in the US and at Thacker Pass. Uh, uh, and also, there was open ground. We could see, you know, what appeared to be sediment hosted, well, sort of, you know, sediments, but prospective sediments sticking out of the ground. But do I, no, we haven't done the work. Uh, so, so it's a good question from Kim. And look, we haven't done the work. We haven't looked at, at uh, other remote sensing. Um, techniques to see if uh, you know there are there are ways to identify this mineralization um, remotely, uh, and it's a good question, and I'd be pretty interested in, in in you know seeing you know if anyone can see these these deposits uh, uh, remotely. No, it's a good question, and we haven't done the work. Is the short answer. Oh, thanks, Lindsay. A question from Dennis Ahn. How are you assaying your samples? Uh, yes, we're using four acid digest, and ooh, got me there. I think it's a standard. It's uh, ALS is standard. Um, uh, um, I think it's OES. Ooh, that might be a question on notice. I'll have to go back and look at that. But they've, they've got a a, a, a package uh, which I think is universal, not just in the US, where it's uh, I think it's a forty eight element um, uh, package with certainly with a four acid digest. We've also uh, tried, uh, done a little bit of work on, on uh, a peroxide leach, because that's actually seen to be a more, give you slightly higher, very slightly higher results. Um, and we, you know, it's one of the things, sort of we've been pretty flat out, because there's only two of us, you know, <laughs> and uh, we've been pretty flat out trying to just manage uh, this. 
Uh, there's, some, there's some more esoteric stuff we'd like to do, like, you know, trial some uh, different as, uh, leeches uh, of the samples. But no, it's a standard, it's just a standard ALS um, uh, for acid leach and, and, and digest. Okay, thanks, Lindsay. Um, question from Graham Roll. Um, if lithium is ionically absorbed on the cement type, have you tried ammonium sulfate to absorb the lithium as sulfate? Not yet, but that's a very good question. Uh, no, uh, I, I, you know, I'd have to say straight up, I'm not a metallurgist, and and we're uh, we're reliant on um, a number of consultants, and actually they've got different views as to how we should proceed. At the moment, we're we're looking predominant. We're we're kind of following in the in the in the slipstream of lith the work that Lithium Americas has done on Thacker Pass and looking at. You know, sulfuric acid is, which is recycled. You know, they, they, um, uh, it's not just a one pass, uh, uh, you know, leech. But no, we haven't done the work on that either. No. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, question from Bill Anslow: What is the global potential for sediment posted lithium deposits? Yeah, as I said, I think earlier on, I think there'll be more of these around. I, I think, I mean, the the reason why we we're attracted to the US is because of the strategic value of this style of deposit to the US, uh, you know, given obviously, as we've seen, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's fortuitous that um, the way things have developed, uh, you know, they've become increasingly focused on domestic sources of lithium. Uh, but I think the same processes that really form brine deposits anywhere in the world, uh, these, these things are almost like an exhumed brine and um, I think you yeah, did this style of mineralization I'm sure would also exist in um, uh, you know around the uh, you know the sailors and in uh, in South America for example. Thanks Lindsay. Uh, last question uh, from the floor uh, Hayden how does it and again this is going to test your metallurgy how does a sediment hosted deposit hold up as far as met were compared to a hard rock deposit? Uh, yeah I think I think the the difference uh, will be in what deleterious elements go into the leach. So when you leach a um, a brine, or sorry, you know, or you take a brine deposit, or you leach a sediment hosted lithium deposit, there are a lot of other cations in there that you don't really want. Yeah, you know, uh, like, you know, magnesium and, and et cetera, sodium, uh, that you then have to remove as part of the purification process. Whereas um, spodumene sort of uh, deposits, you wind up with a concentrate which is relatively clean, this is my understanding, and you don't have, maybe iron could be an issue, but you don't tend to have uh, the, level, the same levels or volumes of deleterious elements as you do in, in uh, sediment or brine deposits. And, and so that's what I was saying. Look, the key to it is the metallurgy, um, not only getting your lithium into solution as cheaply as possible, i.e. with a minimal amount of acid consumption, but then on the other side, being able to drop out uh, the the elements or the, the cations that you don't want uh, and and so you wind up with a nice clean um, lithium carbonate product at the end. Thanks Lindsay. Um, we don't have any more questions from the floor but I will chuck in my chairman special. Uh, you, you mentioned that the, the mercury deposits uh, nearby is that a potential environmental issue for you at McDermott or is there no mercury at all in the no, we've we've analysed for uh, uranium, for mercury, and, and quite a few other deleterious elements, because uh, we're obviously very concerned straight up that there could be issues. Um, and fortunately, you know, in every sample we still religiously assay for the forty-eight element suite, and and. Fortuitously, we we haven't had you know high levels of of uh, fact you know in fact we've got almost no 
you know, um, the negligible background levels of, uh, of um, pretty well anything. You know, we've got high levels of uh, magnesium and calcium and sodium and et cetera, but no, basically no uranium or, or mercury. Okay, and, and I guess the flip side to that is, are there any potential credits in there at all? Yes, um, potentially there is magnesium sulfate could be produced uh, and also so sodium sulfate um, for farming uh, fertilizer and for uh, industrial uh, purposes. Uh, the US obviously is a major industrial economy and they've also got very good infrastructure um, where just over an hour, hour between an hour and an hour and a half's drive from a major railhead at a, a town called Winnemucca. Uh, and from there, obviously, with rail, you can distribute things, you know, sort of all over the country. Um, so, and, and in fact, our, our neighbours, Lithium Americas, there, up until recently, their flow sheets had included credits for um, particularly magnesium sulphate. But uh, other than that, no. So, for example, uh, I mentioned uh, the Rhyolite Ridge deposit of Iron Ears, uh, where they have boron uh, as a as a credit, and in fact, they extract the the boron to make uh, like boric acid, uh, and it almost underwrites the cost of their of their lithium uh, carbonate production. So, I think about between a third and a quarter of their revenue is projected to come from um, a boron. Uh, but unfortunately, in this case, we don't have uh, boron either. So, oh, uh, Well, it sounds like you've got a couple of strings there anyway. So um, yeah. I think we've taken up of your time and uh, we appreciate it. Um, so on behalf of the AIG and ALS, uh, thanks very much for your time, Lindsay. And I hope everyone enjoyed today's talk. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And what, what I will say, look, if there's any more questions, uh, or if I haven't uh, answered the question satisfactorily, just um, flick us an email, and I'll uh, and I'll do my best to to get back to you with a hopefully more comprehensive and and uh, and um, uh, direct response. Thanks very much, Lindsay. And if you want to relive this uh, talk or any other talks, please head to the AIG YouTube channel. Thanks very much, and good evening. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.